raise a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Forward fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the father said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, continuing our quest for everything archaeological, even in the social media age, especially so in our case. Joining me as always from disparate portions of the globe, but always together in spirit, James Waldo, geologist extraordinaire. Good evening, sir. Well, Manka Hanks, how are you doing? Well, I am doing well, and of course, I hope you are. Jason, how are things down there further east? Uh, well, we just, you know, staying here and keeping busy, uh, packing up the house for the big move coming this summer. But other than that, we're uh, just standing by. That's right. I think a lot of people are standing by right now. And, of course, we have to mention the fact that since the last time we all gathered here in the pub, things have changed around the world. It's been a fairly new development here in North America, and many around the globe have been coping with COVID-19 already. We won't belabor that point. I think everybody is already seeing so much in the media. And one of the important things that podcasts provide, of course, is an escape from the reality of the everyday. And so while acknowledging that reality, we hope to offer you a bit of an escape as we go back in time tonight. We've got some great guests, three of them actually. Tonight, So it's going to be a triple feature for the Seven Ages Audio Journal. But again, as goes without saying, I hope everyone out there listening, I hope all of you, all of your loved ones and everyone in your social circles are safe and maintaining safe practices and staying healthy in these trying times. Uh, We would love to hear from you also. You can write to us, Micah, James, or Jason at sevenages.org. We've also got an info at sevenages.org. But again, there are lots of ways you can reach us. Social media, too, like we mentioned there at the outset. Keep us in the loop. Let us know you're doing well out there. And we're going to get to our duty as podcasters now. So, fellas, anyway, with the arrival of spring, apart from all this strange news we've been getting, I'm excited to see flowers in bloom. I'm not so excited about the pollen that we all got choked up on down there at the White Pond site. (laughs) Yeah, you know, we were fortunate to be able to get that uh, last trip into White Pond, South Carolina excavation this year, just before all this really uh, started getting out of hand with COVID-19. But again, uh, like you said, we hope everyone's staying safe out there and enjoying some podcasts. And we're going to try to bring you a very entertaining show tonight. We've got, uh, like you said, three guests. So we're, uh, we're really trying to pack it full for you and hopefully you find it entertaining. Although here is the catch. Two of those three guests are going to join us simultaneously, and in fact, we might as well go ahead and engage the simulcast because we are about to be joined by a couple of gents from merry old England. And in this era of social distancing, it's always good to make friends across great distances. And tonight we're joined by Rupert and Michael, otherwise known as the prehistory guys who are the purveyors of fine content out of the UK, and we want to tell you all about it and have them tell you about it too. But first and foremost, most importantly, welcome to the Seven Ages Audio Journal, Michael and Rupert. Hey, thank thank you very much. much. It's good to be with you. It's really good. We couldn't have put that introduction better ourselves. (laughs) I don't know about that. I don't know about that. But I tell you, it is certainly a pleasure uh, to have this meeting of the minds because we have an awful lot in common, a lot of common goals, and we're real fans of your work. So, yeah, it's, it's truly a pleasure to have you here. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, well, Rupert and Michael, I uh, I was stumbled across your work just kind of doing a, a cursory search on some megalithic sites several months ago and uh, quickly started watching your videos and looking at your content, uh, went over and downloaded the podcast, started listening to episodes of that. And within one or two episodes, I said, oh, yeah, these are someone we definitely <laughs> need to talk to. They are very much uh, similar to what we do here in the United States. And uh, I think we'd have a lot in common. Yeah. And with that being said, um, I've had time to really pour over your content, uh, listen to some of the episodes and some of the interviews that you've done. And uh, having heritage from the United Kingdom and England and Scotland, um, spending some time there myself, I almost felt a little bit ripped off from the time I I spent there <laughs> because there were so many things I was right beside that I missed. And I didn't realize that <laughs> until I really got deep into your content. So. I'd like to begin by saying you've opened up my world and you definitely have me looking forward to my next trip to the United Kingdom. 
That's very well, cool. Th thank you for brilliant. that. That's kind of job done then, really, because it's it's that illuminating the things that people miss is you know part of yeah. our mission in a way, really. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's one. No, go on. Sorry, Mike. You go on. You know, because people tend to stop. You know, visitors. You know, coming for the megalithic stuff, they tend to stop at Stonehenge and and Avery when there's a whole wealth of stuff um, beyond those two monuments. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, I, it, it's actually crazy how you know it, all over Britain that there's always something that's just round the corner and nobody knows it's there or very few people know it's there and it's astonishing that once you go outside places like Stonehenge and Avebury and maybe the Royal Wright Stones you can go to thousands of places around the whole of Britain where you won't see another living soul you'll have the place entirely to yourself because nobody mm. knows it's there mm. it's crazy mm. yeah so our remit is just um, is making people more aware of, uh, uh, you know, the rich prehistory that Britain has. Yeah, that's so important. I mean, and that's really the case anywhere in the world. We find the same thing that when we go places, people are astonished to find that there are archaeological sites and historic sites, you know, adjacent to where they live, you know, just beyond mm. the tree line in the park. I know that you guys encounter an awful lot of that there. And what got you interested in, in wanting to not only preserve, but also broaden people's awareness of the sites that are right under their noses? <laughs> Do you want to take that, Mike? <laughs> well, I think that starting point was what we we met um, doing something else. We had a different idea in mind and then discovered that we both had this interest in megalithic site. Rupert, you'd been taking people to Dartmoor to um, expose them to uh, the, and the, and the, the, the joys man, of places like that. I'd done a yes, lot of, of course. Uh, leading tours around prehistoric sites for some years, actually, yeah. And I think it had been something lurking in the back of my mind. I, I wanted to uh, do a, a sort of magnum opus. And the to me, the standing stones and stone circles of England, Wales, Ireland and Scotland seem to be a, a, a subject just ripe to be have a film made about them. If only for the aesthetic qualities, you know, because taking a journey through uh, the landscape of... Of, uh, of of the British Isles, you know, is, is a really darn good excuse for getting the camera out in the first place. But having, you know, f finding Rupert as a partner to, you know, go on that journey with and to and to take people with um, was just a too big, a great an opportunity to pass up. And so, you know, it took a two two and a half years of our lives to it did. It get did. that original film finished. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we're really so uh, grateful for the results. You know, it's not been a blockbuster, but the people that have taken in the film and, and watched it have been so, so... Um, uh, the feedback has just been great. And as you know, we've had that effect of having people look a bit further. So, well, we anyway. did take second place in the Archaeology Channel Film Awards, didn't ah, we? Ah, there you go. You, you oh, know, man. I, I'm going to bang I, that drum. We take it as an aggregate first because we, we, uh, we actually came second in... Uh, in both categories, the uh, the public vote and the jury vote, uh, we came second in both, and different people came first. So we took that as an aggregate, aggregate first. first yeah. Yeah. I'd say so. Yeah, I think that's more than justified. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, it's so true. I mean, you know, Mike and I are very lucky that we just. Uh, you know, we just clicked working together. We're so productive when we work together, and we just have we have a blast. Yeah. You know, uh, we do have a great time. And uh, as Mike said, you know, we've got uh, we've gathered such a, a following of people who are really passionately into their uh, prehistory. Yeah. Know, and, uh, and and that bounces us along. You know, the uh, the followers are growing all the time. Long may that continue. You know? Yes, indeed. Speaking of the documentary Standing with Stones, uh, it. It's absolutely encompassing of, of, again, all these sites that I didn't even know existed. And I, I really think you guys did an, an excellent job of not only documenting all these sites, but uh, lending a bit of humor, a bit of air, of, of mystery to it. Uh, I really enjoyed the way it was filmed. Uh, it gives that feeling of being there on site, how some documentaries sort of miss that when they just throw content at you. But you guys actually went to the site, spent time there gave some insight, some background on each place. And again, I'm scribbling notes as I'm watching it. I've never heard of this place. I've never heard of this place. So now I've effectively have at least six months worth of uh, 
internet <laughs> researching to do to, yeah. to learn more about these places yeah. and, and definitely will be reflected in my next trip. So let's talk about the film. You, we've talked about it a little bit. Mm-hmm. You said it took about two years to film and it begins yeah. basically at Balawar Baro and works yeah. its way west. So uh, with the establishment of deciding to do the film and just give us some of the road stories about things that were happening along the way. <laughs> oh wow! Uh, where, where shall we start with, with yeah. that? Well, uh, it wasn't necessarily filmed in sequence, although the film takes that uh, that journey um, from uh, Ballowall Barrel, Ballowall Barrow, in Cornwall, you know, and we just snake across the country through England, through Wales, across to Ireland, back across to Northern England, up to Scotland, and up to the Scottish Isles, and 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 across, and that's the journey in in a nutshell in coming encompassing a hundred sites did we film at uh, eventually? Yeah, well, we, we actually we filmed at just over a hundred sites, but I think it was a hundred that actually made the edit, wasn't it? Um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you, you, can yes. get, you can get the book, um, which That's actually true. my microphone is standing on at the moment, so I can't even open it and show you. But um, <laughs> I'm sure it's on the website, and we'll put that out here a little later as well. <laughs> yeah. Cool. But our uh, modus operandi... Um, was mostly um, taking chunks out of, what, two, three, four, five, I think six weeks was our uh, biggest uh, stretch out at a time in a camper van that we purchased specifically for the uh, adventure uh, and and lived out out of that. So we did a heck of a lot of planning, but, you know, when it push came to shove, it was seat of the pants time because we arrived at sites and found that, that's not what it said in the textbook. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and found we had a different take on stuff. So yeah. we, were, we had the flexibility to be able to, you know, regroup, re, uh, write another script and, and, uh, and go out the next day instead. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Some of this it, is detailed in the film, too. But, you know, if you could maybe give us an example of how things would be different from what you read versus when you go to the science. Yeah. Without doubt, the top of my list would be... Um, uh, would be Brinkesley V in uh, 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 on Anglesey, where every single textbook that you can find says that because you go into the um, the uh, the burial chamber, if you like, of this tomb, this passage grave, and every single textbook says that this pillar, this standing stone, it says it's a carefully dressed pillar of stone carefully dressed means that it was cut Mm -hmm. to be that shape and uh you know we'd never been there before it was the first time we'd walked in there i just took one look at that and said there's no way that's cut that's natural and uh and the only thing i could think of and in fact it would be nice to get mike's input here um because the only thing i knew of that naturally looked that shape is a fossil tree trunk and because it does look like fossil wood uh it was Oh, Lord, it was years. We could not get a geologist to uh, take any interest at all. You know, I've got a bit of a geological uh, you know, background, but not a lot. Um, and it was only, oh, something like five years ago, was it, Mike? Something like that, that, uh, yeah. uh, that a geologist had been there with an archaeologist who we were uh, connected with, who recognized it as blue schist. Now, blue schist, <laughs> it's one of those rocks it's, uh, you know, that only happens in subduction zones. So it's rolled up uh, um, from, uh, from the depths, which is why you can get these cylindrical forms. But every single textbook you can ever find, apart from Standing with Stones, the book, says, <laughs> says that it's this carefully dressed, dressed pillar of stone. So, of course, we got there. With a script already written, um, you know, because we'd done a lot of research on how the site had actually developed over millennia. And uh, and that was a complete regroup. I, um, I actually sat on the floor of that burial chamber for quite a long time in a bit of shock because it was just nothing was what I was expecting. We at were all. genuinely freaked out, you know, because yeah, we didn't know what to, to do with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Because we could tell what was sitting in front of us if we said what we was on our minds in the film. Yeah. It was going to be controversial. So we had a a long conversation, so long a conversation about it that it was we we did the whole of Ireland before we came back. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. A, a week or so later to actually uh, do the filming. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so that was the prime example of something not being what it said on the tin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and you see that but quite there, a lot. But there were a number. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, and that, that's part of the beauty, I think, of getting out. You know, our, our geologist here, we've had a similar experience with him once at a little roadside museum that showed what what looked very much, I guess, to the untrained eye, like petroglyphs. Uh, yeah. Whereas, in fact, James is like, those aren't petroglyphs, those are box concretions, right? <laughs> Oh, uh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that was a similar thing kind of going on because the marks in that yeah. stone in the in Brinkerthley V, they look so like they could only it, have been made. It looks by. like wood. It, it even yeah. looks like there are places where bark has uh, has broken away yeah. to reveal, uh, you know, the wood underneath. So, yeah, you see, now it, it takes a, a, a geologist, you know, and uh, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 Mike hiding away there. You know, it takes a geologist to actually recognize some of these things as as being natural. Because lay people, you know, you, you look at something because, you know, geology can do some pretty freaky things sometimes. Yes. And, uh, yeah, but al although we kind of liked the controversy, you know, like the kind of mystical aspect of it, you know, we were always open to hearing, you know, what the solution to this problem was. Mm. Um, we we didn't uh, sort of hang on to that idea of a fossilized tree trunk. Nice though it was, we were just open to, you know, what was so rather than, uh, yeah, what we probably some people would prefer to be so. If you see what I mean, absolutely it's true. But I think it's also important to make the, you know, the point that we ultimately made was that it actually doesn't matter whether it's a fossil tree trunk or not because it looks like one, yeah. which means that our ancestors, the people who actually built that tomb would have thought that it was one. And then that's why it would have been this magical totem or whatever that they would have put in the tomb because, you know, it's it's a tree made of stone. Oh. Why, why would they not do yeah. something with that? Gives you a whole different perspective on things. James? Yeah, you know, the, the, the kind of a neat thing about blue schist is it's, you know, in the world of schist, I guess you could say, it's it's probably one of the most rare rare types uh and also like you were saying and you know in geology in, in general there's a lot of things that um well i say a lot of things maybe there's a few things that um mm -hmm. many times can be can be uh, uh mistaken for man-made um man-made objects or man-made landscapes or whatever and the, the thing that comes to mind especially in that part of world part of the world is uh giant's causeway um uh-huh yeah, yeah, so yeah that, that's, yeah. that's a good point yeah yeah, columnar joining is what that's called. Yeah, basalt has some very interesting properties. And, you know, again, that's very similar to what you see at uh, Devil's Tower in Wyoming here in the States. It looks superficially like a massive tree trunk. It's actually probably yeah. an ancient remnant of, of a volcanic intrusion. And you do yeah. see that basaltic columnar sort of appearance on the exterior. But, again, superficially, people look at that and they say, it's a giant tree trunk. I mean, yeah. a really, really giant tree trunk. So, you know, looks can be deceiving, but but that's fascinating because I can really relate to what you guys are talking about, getting to the site and going, whoa, we really have to kind of rethink what we're seeing here. Yes. I have to say my apologies if you're getting a notification bleeps from my computer. <laughs> they're, they're actually coming from a guy who is building a henge. Oh. In, uh, <laughs> I'm getting notifications from a guy who's building a, a modern henge up in uh, Shropshire. Anyway, that's the explanation for the bleeps. Real-time updates, ladies and gents. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Transatlantic for that matter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, as we've discussed, the, the film Standing with Stones truly is monumental. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Tell us about the origin of the podcast. How did you make that leap into the podcast itself? It actually evolved from because uh, uh, Mike and I, you know, after we were, we were pretty exhausted after Standing with Stones and uh, and had essentially gone back to our day jobs, if you like, uh, which, uh, you know, Mike has an acting background. I have a natural history background, uh, nature photography and the like. And uh, the thing is that I was still getting emails, like maybe not every week, but I was getting a few a month for years. They just kept on coming in. We saw Standing With Stones. We thought it was great. And I thought, well, how often have you actually sat down? You've enjoyed a program. Mm. And so you thought, Do you know what? I'll write to them. And I thought, well, I never have. Uh, so I thought, <laughs> so I thought if, all the, if I'm getting emails all the time, then there must be quite a lot of people who are enjoying this. And uh, and I called Mike and I said, look, this is crazy. We should be doing this. And uh, so it was entirely Mike's idea that we, <clears throat> excuse me, that we uh, 
kick off our, you know, get back together again and kick it off with podcasts. Mm. And uh, yeah, I mean, they've just, uh, they're sort of gathering their own momentum, aren't they? And we started off, you know, because uh, Standing With Stones was, a, you know, a pretty good brand and it, it served us well. And, uh, the, you know, our baseline of fans had hung on to that and mm. we kind of kept up with them uh, as well. Um, but as a name for a film, it's good. But uh, it was only a few months ago that we began to realise that as a brand, it didn't tell people what we were really doing. Yeah. Because as the podcast had progressed, we'd found ourselves expanding our remit, you know, beyond the megalithic and and uh, back into much further reaches of, of prehistory and coming a bit forward into the Iron Age, indeed. So mm -hmm. not only was it not serving a new audience, but it you know, wasn't telling people what we really did. So we shifted then, what, in September, was it, to the prehistory guys? Yeah, that's, yeah. A, good, that's a good way to put it all out there and of course you know history i think a lot of people uh miss the fact if if they have only a cursory interest you know history of course means generally we have some sort of record through artifacts through writings you know and other kinds of yeah. accounts that are passed down the problem the disconnect when we talk about actual prehistory is that we don't have often language or writing or even if there were languages obviously probably used by ancient cultures we still don't know exactly you know what their mm. perception of these environments what of the, what these sites was again like you pointed out there rupert uh, what looked like a tree to them, geologically speaking, in modern times, we might be able to identify as something else. But when we think about what it meant to them, that's one of the big disconnects is looking at prehistory and getting into the minds of people who left no written record about the sites that yeah. they worked with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that that really is the exciting thing. You know, I think the, the other thing about history per se is that as soon as you're talking about history, you're really talking about the last couple of thousand years. OK, I know there's aspects of, uh, you know, the Middle East, what have you, where you can go back further. But generally speaking, in pure history terms, we're talking about the last couple of thousand years, which means there's not a huge cultural difference from where we are now. All right. There, there, there are shifts, obviously, largely borne by uh, technology of whatever sorts, uh, not necessarily modern technology, but, uh, but you know, development through history. So when you go back prior to that and you're trying to make sense of how people lived their lives from the scant remains that you pull out of the ground, it's just the most intoxicating jigsaw puzzle. You, you're, yeah. you're trying to pull these clues out, but without making big leaps each time you've just got to go slowly 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 because you know that the trouble is as soon as people go off in one direction it's a bit like saying crop circles um extraterrestrials you know without ever having tried to seek a you know an alternative solution it's like as soon as you've gone that far down a road to the left then you're not coming back you know um <laughs> And so that's why it's really important to do all these things just little by little by little. And it's amazing how much information you can pull out, especially now with modern tech of isotopes oh, wow. and yeah. uh, DNA and, you know, and oh, so we find just... the, that uh, we're getting overwhelmed. And because we're not academics and we don't come from academic backgrounds. So you, you spent some time, you know, in the halls of academia, but more than I have. <laughs> so, you know, reading scientific papers, finding ourselves reading scientific papers and, and catching up, especially on the incredible detail that comes out of DNA analysis and isotope, um, isotope analysis, uh, it's blowing our little minds quite... <laughs> <laughs> we just hope that we're hanging on. We're hanging on for dear life here, and hoping we're <laughs> conveying the right information to our listeners, or at least getting them, you know, excited about what's going on. Or oh, it um, seems evident but, to me that you are. Yeah. <laughs> we are actually. We uh, we're very rigorous. Mike does himself down a lot. Uh, we're very rigorous in, uh, in making sure that we're telling people. Uh, the right things, uh, you know, and we do correct ourselves in further broadcasts if we find that we did make a mistake. As far as I'm aware, that's only happened once. Um, uh, you know, we will publicly correct ourselves if we made a mistake. But, um, and that was so light, I can't even remember what it was anyway. So, yeah. Ah, <laughs> right. It pays to do that research, that homework. James had a question he wanted to jump in here with. So, uh, as we kind of come towards the end of the conversation I, you know we're we're talking about all of these sites and, and sites that 
you know, as you mentioned, people didn't even know we're there. So from the Seven Ages standpoint, if we were to visit England or the British Isles, if you had to make a recommendation on a site to see that's not one of the most famous sites, something that we don't know about, what would be your recommendation? Do you know about Kalanish? <laughs> that's the one. That's, That's the one. The one. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, it's a, it's a, yeah. It, you can't fly in there, I'm afraid. Mm. <laughs> it's a bit of a journey up. It's one of the Western Isles. Uh, Lewis is the island off the west coast of Scotland, mm -hmm. up there. Um, but uh, Lewis certainly, yeah. Uh, it's we could tell a tale about Lewis, but it, we're running out of time. <laughs> but about yes. uh, Calanish, but uh, time time is short. Uh, but definitely one of our favourite uh, favourite sites. Well, when we yeah, mentioned the Standing Stone Stone Circle with lunar alignments uh, that comes into operation every uh, eighteen point six years. And that's about wraps it up, wraps it up in a nutshell, and it's beautiful wow. as well. Yeah. yeah, but it is like no other site. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is nothing like it anywhere, uh, and it's specifically built for the moon. So uh, uh, yeah. It's it, it's in standing with stones. Um, yeah, it's oh, okay. uh, uh, it's just an astonishing place. Uh, you know, as Michael said, you know, it's uh, the, uh, now you see we could talk for half an hour about Cavendish. You see, uh, <laughs> no, no, we answered the question. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. Well, well, the next part is, of course, we've got to come over there and visit, and you guys have got to take yeah. us out there to the Isle of Lewis, and we're going to have you know to what? have that's, a look. That's a deal. For sure. That, that's yeah. a any deal. excuse. Any excuse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, now, of course, the website where people can find you guys is the prehistoryguys.uk. Uh, there you'll yep. find the podcast, of course, links to Standing with Stones, and also other kind of information about you guys. And I do want to mention that uh, you guys uh, are working with Patreon, right, so that people can support your yeah. work. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, I mean it's interesting choosing a, a business model or you know uh, earning a crust or two <laughs> from mm -hmm. what we do, and uh, our aim is to professionalise because uh, the only thing is we we feel that we'd we'd like to create more content. We just feel we're moving in slow motion uh, so much of the time because we need to go away and do other things uh, most weeks. So, yeah, um, Patreon, uh, our Patreon support, we are very, very grateful for. And uh, yes, we're always open to people having a look at uh, how they can contribute. Absolutely. Well, we hope that many people who listen to this podcast are going to actually, all of them, head right on over there and check out the Prehistory <laughs> Guys in the UK. If you are one of our UK listeners, be sure and check out the work that they do and also uh, consider you know, learning more about some of the science that these fine gents are working on and, and reporting about. We certainly hope to get over there to the UK, uh, the motherland, as I like to call it, because, again, that's where my heritage <laughs> is. I can't wait to come back home and uh, get out and, and see part of the country with you guys. So thank you so much for joining us here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Thank it's been you a great for pleasure. Us. It's been a great pleasure. Yes, thanks a lot. So, like our guests there, they're very active on social media. So are we. So don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, on YouTube, or at sevenages.org. Absolutely, yes. And speaking of social media, for the remainder of the program, we will be joined by Raven Todd De Silva. And she'll be joining us to talk about archaeology in the social media age. It's fantastic work that she's doing, and I'm eager to get into this conversation with her and the rest of the gang right here on the 7 Ages Audio Journal. Raven Todd De Silva is an art conservator, archaeologist, and the resident dropper of knowledge on Dig It with Raven, a YouTube channel that you should follow. And she's also, of course, on social media. It's part of an initiative for archaeological education and public outreach. Raven holds a bachelor's in ancient civilizations from the University of Toronto, Canada, and also an MSc in the Conservation and Restoration of Cultural Heritage from University of Amsterdam. She has taken part in archaeological projects in Greece, Italy, Northern Macedonia, and Oman. Raven is part of the 2020 Amsterdam Troy Project and is the conservator for Southwest Archaeology Digs in Safara and Troya in Portugal, where I was recently. 
This passion for social media outreach and public archaeology has also led Raven to consult and produce digital content for archaeological projects to help them reach their fullest online potential. And she's doing great things online herself. So first and foremost, welcome to the Seven Ages Audio Journal, Raven. Hi, thank you so much for having me on. It is truly our pleasure. Yeah, yes, indeed. And I got to say, you know, it's it's always fun when we can sit down with a fellow science communicator, someone who shares the same passions that we do, not only for archaeology, but uh, for having a presence on social media, uh, putting out great content like you do on your YouTube channel. So again, it's it's always a pleasure to sit down and, and explore some of those fields together. Now, something that I think is very unique to you, not only the fact that you're doing uh, social media interactions, making great videos for your YouTube channel, you're doing art conservation. So that's not something that Hmm. we've had the opportunity to discuss previously here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. So I kind of want to begin there because you work in such a unique field. So for those who may be unfamiliar with that side, very important side, mind you, of history and archaeology, give us some details on exactly what an art conservator does and and what you're involved with on a daily basis. All right. Well, for art conservation, it's essentially cultural heritage protection. So there is a very big difference you might have noticed between art conservation and art restoration. So with art conservation, our main goal is to try and keep the objects as stable and as protected for as long as possible, essentially. So we want to protect everything that is important to our cultural heritage so it can be enjoyed and studied and can stay a lot longer within our our records, essentially, for us to you know enjoy it forever, essentially. So that's kind of the main thing behind it, it kind of that's kind of maybe a, a glorified dis- description of it. I feel like sometimes I just have a degree in cleaning. Um, but uh, it's actually a really, really interesting field. It's a lot more scientific than people think as well, which is something that I was also surprised in once getting into it. It's all about the materials themselves and how they degrade over time, the chemistry behind everything and how we're interacting with it, not just with the air and the pollutants around it, but the materials that we use to preserve it, the ones that we house it in, everything like that. So depending on what your specialty is, there are tons and tons of subjects you can specialize in, textiles, photography, furniture, paintings. I personally do more glass, ceramics, and stone. So a few more of the archaeological objects as well. Your day can look pretty different from day to day. One day I'm mixing chemicals in a fume hood and the next day I'm on site, you know, putting mortar onto a church or, you know, consolidating a wall that's maybe crumbling on an archaeological site. Yeah. And I would imagine that, you know, in a field such as that, there's probably oftentimes very little margin for error. So is it stressful knowing that, you know, you could be uh, you don't want to be that person who does something wrong and, and maybe destroys a piece of art or, uh, you know, does mm-hmm. the, the thing. One thing you never want to do, which is be responsible for something like that. So I would imagine, you know, uh, a real attention to detail when it comes to chemistry, when it comes to understanding how these things are going to react with each other. Um, is it mm-hmm. stressful in that way? It is a little bit. It's very detail oriented uh, because not only are you looking at very minute, maybe small part of an object, but then you also have to think of the bigger picture at the same time. So you're always constantly juggling what the whole object object is going to look like versus what, uh, you know, you're working on right now in this one little maybe square centimeter that you're really trying to to fix. So that's always a big thing, uh, a big concern that we have. The other thing is, yeah, with all of our chemicals and things, We do try to use as stable materials as possible, things that are as reversible as possible, but sometimes we can't do that. So usually it's a a one kind of shot or else it can be very difficult to remove that treatment. So it can be a little bit tense sometimes, but you just got to be very patient and careful and methodical when you're dealing with it. Yeah, I'm enjoying hearing about this process a little and also the science applied to it, which is one of the things that's, I think, important about the video series that you do uh, online. And, of course, we should mention that Raven has a fantastic website, Dig It With Raven. That URL, I believe, is digitwithraven.com. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Excellent. And if you go and you watch these videos or if you go on YouTube and follow her YouTube channel with the same name, Dig It With Raven, 
One of the things that you have pointed out, I think, is that, yes, there is an art and actually there is an artistry to the science that is applied to archaeology. A lot of laymen I have seen who criticize the archaeological process have made assertions like, well, you know, archaeology is not a science and archaeologists are essentially glorified <laughs> art historians. I'm thinking, no, actually, that's quite different. That's, that's, that's not the case at all. But there is certainly an element of art historicity and also art conservation that is integral to the archaeological process. Could you speak to that a little bit? for us? Uh, for sure. So it, I find that nowadays, especially now with science progressing the way it is, and it's getting into pretty much everything that we're doing. Yes, maybe back 100 years ago, archaeology was maybe a little bit more of a art historian sort of approach to it, where you'd go, you'd find the nice fancy thing that spoke to the art historical record that was maybe more exciting to the development of art. But nowadays, especially with all the things that we have with GIS, we have, you know, all the mapping that we're doing. We're using drones now to do all these 3D imaging and we're using science isotopes for analyzing teeth to see what people ate and how they lived. All the things about our bones, everything that we're really going into now with a lot more science. It does have that kind of really cool mix, that intertextuality, that that all those you know disciplines that are kind of getting mushed all together to make this amazing field that we have as archaeologists today. And especially now with the art history, we always need to know something about what we're digging up to make sure that we know whether it's important or not. And then art conservation, you know, we don't want to go through anything or leave a site, for example, uh, uncared for, especially if it's open to the public. That is all kind of becoming one large sort of community that we're building. And that's why I find that there needs to be this sort of communication that we're having, not just within academia, but within the general public. Yeah. And we see that a lot when we have assisted on dig sites, especially uh, in the kinds of archaeological uh, digs and the processes that we've been involved with, uh, the working between geologists and archaeologists. It's very much an interdisciplinary study, as most are. But, you know, in one of your videos, probably in several, uh, something else that you have pointed out as far as misconceptions is I've noticed a lot of people, and I'm paraphrasing what you said here, Raven, a lot of people, mm -hmm. when we talk about archaeology, they think we're talking about paleontology. This is completely mm -hmm. different. Very, very different. So paleontology digs up dinosaurs, whereas archaeologists study the remains of human activity. So it's, you know, a couple million years apart we have there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, I want to return to, you know, your graduate degree. So you've recently graduated from the University of Amsterdam. And if mm -hmm. I'm correct, your degree is in stone ceramics and glass conservation. Is that correct? That it is, yes. Say there is an archaeological excavation underway. And being that you are multidisciplinary in that way, having the knowledge of archaeologists and of a conservationist, when would you switch hats, per se, on an excavation? So one minute you're doing the archaeology, the next minute there is a need for the other half of your knowledge, the art conservation. What kind of situation will we see where you would switch from one hat to another? I've switched a couple times. Uh, for example, in Greece, there was a very delicate excavation area that needed some help, for example. So we found like a, a pit burial, essentially, with some finds in it that... If you were trying to excavate it normally, it would be it would just disintegrate. So it's all that kind of careful stuff that would maybe need some help getting out of the ground that a archaeologist might need assistance with, or we might need some chemicals. We might need to consolidate something in the ground before we're able to lift it. Uh, it happens a lot with bones that are very you know careful and delicate. We've done it with uh, metal, for example, that may be sticking out into the profile. So it's not quite excavated yet, but the part that is exposed does need to be consolidated and protected and to make sure that no one else uh, maybe will damage it. I've done block lifting before. So again, if it's something that needs to be taken out of the ground in one hole before being properly, carefully excavated in a lab per se, that's when, again when I would switch hats. Uh, some days I'm spending, you know, two days with a pickaxe, and then the next day I've got my dental tools and my scalpels really carefully digging out something from the ground because uh, they need that kind of that fine motor skill, dexterity, and pretty much kind of the patience. I find that uh, conservators have a lot more patience than archaeologists will sometimes. So uh, they need something like that to make sure that it comes out correctly. And then in the lab, 
that's when the main kind of hat switches over to conservator where all of the special fines would be taken in by someone with a conservation background to make sure that the ones that are needed um so to make sure that the ones that for example need more help than others or more care are properly taken care of and housed and cleaned for making sure that we're making them kind of you know last essentially i would also then be gluing them back together if we have a full pot or something with an archaeological profile i'd be the one to piece it all together essentially Right. You know, we have an inter- international listenership here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal, and that's one of the beautiful things about social media and uh, new media in general. You can reach people in all parts of the globe, as I know you do with your videos. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, being from Canada, but living in the Netherlands, uh, mm-hmm. you, of course, are, and part of what you do with your own uh, conservation work is uh, educate the public about conventions in your part of the world with relation to archaeology. Can I ask you a little bit about uh, the, I believe it's the Valletta Treaty. It had been previously, I think, the uh, the Malta Convention. But uh, you had a post about this at your website in relation to rescue and commercial archaeology. Let's talk a little bit about what that is and what it means for archaeology conducted in your part of the world. Yeah, of course, sure. I'm not the biggest expert on it, but it was published uh, in 1992, uh, the day before I was born, actually, which was kind of funny. And it pretty much states there's all these other cultural heritage um, kind of articles to it. But the main one for commercial archaeology is that everything where every sort of building project that will, quote, disturb the ground, essentially disturb the soil where there will be digging happening, archaeology has to happen first. So that means the company that wants to actually build on a site has to pay for a an archaeological company to come in and do a survey to make sure that wherever they are building is not going to disturb anything of archaeological significance, which I think is really important, especially on the European continent, pretty much all over the world, essentially, because people, you know, how many times have we seen people digging somewhere and all of a sudden something pops up and then we realize that there's a whole site underneath it. So this careful approach to building to make sure that nothing is going to be damaged or, you know, they're going to make sure that the proper excavation happens before building is extremely important. Yeah. In the United States, especially, often what we see Mm -hmm. with cultural resource management uh, can tend to be a little different in the sense that sometimes people, you know, they have purchased land and they have the permits to be able to dig or to build. And only if there is evidence of archaeology or something worthy of study by archaeologists do cultural resource management uh, become involved. So it's it's kind of a backward process uh, here stateside where you have to find something before they get involved in many instances, whereas where you are and what you're describing, there has to be an archaeological survey before they ever, you know, break the earth. Mm Mm-hmm. That's, that's what I think is super important about it, to make sure that they're doing that research beforehand. It doesn't always have to be a complete dig or anything, but just that basic research and the looking into making sure that we're not disturbing anything is something that should be implemented worldwide. Yeah, I agree. And you know, it certainly is important. And if nothing else, that's great to hear uh, that that's happening in, throughout Europe because it's at least providing jobs and job security for people working in these fields. So that's a, that's a great thing as well. There's something, uh, Raven, that you discuss on your Conservation 101 video that's along these lines, and I wanted to get into that a little bit, where you talk Mm -hmm. about uh, the preservation of cultural property. And so we kind of touched on that a little bit, but let's get a little bit more into that. So in your video, Conservation 101, you're discussing the term cultural property. Um, When you're referring to that term, what do you mean by that personally, and what does that mean to you when you're referring to it? Ooh, that's a loaded question. (laughs) So cultural property, it can be anything, really. We have, you know, cultural heritage. We have intangible heritage, tangible heritage. Of course, conservation, we work a lot with mostly tangible heritage. And for me, cultural property is something that I would say kind of holds significance for the history of the world. It could be, uh, you know, it could be anything from natural, it could be man-made, it could just, it has to have something for me that would 
lead to us understanding our world a little bit more and maybe appreciating it a little bit more as well. So anything that kind of adds to our shared cultural heritage globally. Yeah, very good. So, I mean, I see where you're coming from then. I know what you mean by a loaded mm-hmm. question. It's something that, you know, it's kind of hard to necessarily always put these things in, in terms, but it's it's uh, it's very important that you're mindful of cultural property, your cultural heritage, and all the things that go into that. Um, and, and so yes. I know exactly what you mean. Sometimes those terms are kind of hard to, to define down to it's that It's very degree. difficult. Yeah, especially, for example, if you might not have a connection to an object, but there's a whole other community that does. Right, which is right. fundamentally what's so important about archaeology. I mean, really is you know applying both a understanding that we can sometimes glean from history, but also utilizing analytic, especially in the case of prehistory, uh, utilizing analytical methods uh, that may help us to understand what an object taken out of its proper contextual you know, place and time, uh, what it may have meant to ancient cultures and what that may mean to certain cultures today. That heritage aspect is, is so very important. And again, as you're saying, before we ever actually dip the shovel into the earth, and that really, in my opinion, should be the case all over the world because people have been all over the world for, again, as ongoing studies here on the North American continent are showing for far longer probably than we previously thought, and we need to be aware of that and the cultural impact of the discovery of new things about the past. Oh, for sure, definitely. It's, it's you know, you never know when you're going to pump into something and yeah, if you look at one thing and it has no meaning to you, but if you really look at it and you understand it, you'll realize that it has such a importance, not just to the culture that it has meaning to, but to everyone. Yeah. Raven, you know, you uh, probably have been asked this before, and I think we all get this question, you know, how did you get involved in what you do and, you know, what inspired you to become an archaeologist? I have a bit of an idea, I think, Jason and I, having looked at your website and spent some time on your YouTube channel, we know that you share a love for Egypt that Jason and I both have. And I often find myself in conversations with people who look at things like the pyramids and say, you know, why go to all that trouble? What would have been the reason people did this? And it seems yet again that what we maybe are missing is a complete understanding of the, you know, the spirituality and the religion of ancient Egyptians. Of course, we we know an awful lot about that, and we're continuing to learn more. But it is difficult, I, I think, for us to remove ourselves from the modern cultural context and often, you know, a very kind of secularized worldview that we have in the modern era, it's hard for us to put ourselves in the ancient mind and see the significance uh, of the monuments and their lifestyle. You've spent a lot of time studying Egypt, I believe, based on the photographs on your website, you spent some time there too. Do you ever get that feeling that you go there and you've traveled back in time and you're seeing the world through different eyes and a world that has a very vastly different context than the world we know today? Oh, 100%. When I was there back in 2016, you know, I was, it was a very interesting time to be in Egypt. It was very shortly after all of the um, issues that they were having. And I, there was no, there were pretty much barely any other tourists there. So it was actually something really special to experience what you just described because I had been reading about them. I've learned about them. I've written papers on them. And you just always expect that. Yeah, they're there, but you never really think about what it would be like to see them in person. You know, it's just to make them actually like a real thing. And when you're walking inside of them, you're really feeling maybe just not just the weight of you know all of the rocks that are upon you right now that could collapse, but <laughs> just the weight of the history that they have behind it. I went in and I was at the front of my group. And once it kind of opens up to that first main chamber in the the Great Pyramid, there was no one else in front of me. And that feeling that you get when you first enter it that way is probably one of the most amazing experiences that you can ever have because you really do feel like you have stepped back in time and that you start to understand them a lot more. But um, for me, that was the most amazing thing I think that was that was there being being able to for example I was alone with um with King Tut essentially in his tomb with the guy who making sure that no one was damaging the tomb but it was just me him and King Tut in the tomb and you really get that more personable feel something you just can't get in a textbook and you start to understand it you appreciate it and just I would say the gravity of it really becomes a thing 
Yeah, books really are wonderful. They'll take you to different places, maybe even to different planets. But when it comes to studying the ancient past, there's only so much the imagination can do, huh? <laughs> you really have to kind of go Definitely. there. Yeah, for sure. Right. And the, yeah, you, what you said with maybe not us completely understanding, you know, why go through all the trouble of building such things. And then when you're actually there and you're seeing them, you realize that mostly what one of the main human things that we've had for ever is just the want to be remembered, mm, yeah. you know, and have that legacy, that kind of something to live on after you die. And that can be transformed into, yeah, a giant pyramid, a big tomb. It could be putting your mark on a building, you know, a little bit of graffiti or building something and putting effort into it or having even having children and leaving things behind. And you're realizing that that's just a human thing that we've had for thousands and thousands of years. And it really hits hard when you see these monuments in person. Yeah. Mm. You know, it's, it's so powerful. We say this all the time. Every time we have an opportunity to travel uh, to any archaeological site, historical site, or just in nature in general, and be able to, to take in the grandeur and, and understand uh, the passion, like you're talking about, of those people that came before us to um, build monuments, to build memorials, to uh, create things that speak of their life and their culture. And uh, oftentimes, uh, we meet people who've been you know, archaeologists for many years who still haven't had that opportunity to travel to a lot of these places. And so when we do get to go there, uh, we consider ourselves very fortunate to do so. Uh, it kind of takes me back to uh, something that I, I read on your web page. So right there on the front, you have a, a magnificent quote from famed British archaeologist and adventurer Sir Mortimer Wheeler. And the quote is as follows. In a simple, direct sense, archaeology is a science that must be lived must be seasoned with humanity. Dead archaeology is the driest dust that blows. And I think that's profoundly important to the dis discussion that we're having right now. Uh, archaeology, while you're studying the past, it requires uh, going there. You have to touch it, taste it, be a part of the culture. And, and that's what you have to do to understand this science. And I think a lot of times that may be something that's missing from a lot of people's research. You can only spend so much time in a lab, so much time uh, studying books. You have to get out there and live it. Uh, what inspired you? I mean, I think it's pretty obvious, but why did you feel the need to include that quote on your webpage? For me, that quote really spoke to what I was trying to do with this whole outreach program, because yes, everyone le learns from books or they always have, you know, the history class where everyone thinks they have this one image of an archaeologist, you know, kind of like the old white man in a blazer with, you know, elbow patches on or the complete opposite, which is just Indiana Jones, essentially. It's one of those two. And they don't really go further than that. They don't really think of anything other than that. And then maybe the pyramids or anything big in, in that kind of sense, you know, uh, for example, in Peru with Machu Picchu or anything like that. But then... When you are living archaeology, when you're getting out from behind the book, when you're actually going to experience what archaeology actually is and you are understanding it from a perspective that speaks to you and not just the academics, it is something that can really change your whole perspective of the field. So that's what I want to be doing with this channel. I, When I was studying archaeology, all I wanted was a few YouTube videos about stratigraphy, explaining things that I was learning in class to give me a, a useful study guide, essentially, in a way that was fun, informative, but also just more approachable. Because I find, especially with lab work and everything, it can get quite caught up in the science communication where a lot of people don't understand it. So with archaeology, you know, you need to go in there, need to live it for yourself. And that means we need to make it accessible for everyone as well. So that way we excite people and have them understand what we're actually doing. That's true. I can't imagine how many people I've talked to. And in fact, I have to look at myself and, and you know, probably count myself among them. People who got in. Uh, probably initially interested in archaeology after watching films like Indiana Jones when I was a child. 
uh, mom and dad would take me to see Disney movies and, you know, I'm just snoring through them. I just didn't care. And they're like, you know, maybe he has more mature tastes. And so I, I was like five years old and they took me to see Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. And, you know, during some of the more violent scenes, my mom's covering my eyes and I'm like, mom, cut it out, you know. <laughs> I just it, it did have a profound effect on me. I got interested in history because of that film. I got interested in all sorts of different things, you know, and also some of the monumental structures, uh, as well as some of the mythology and the religion and the many aspects that are, you know, baked into a Hollywood production like that on your own website. Uh, your The brief version of your bio says that, you know, you like being Indiana Jones or at very least doing videos where you, you know, kind of are riffing on Indiana Jones. Obviously, it had a, a an impact on you, too. But there's that other side of it, too, where more people see that and they think, well, this is what archaeology is all about. So is it both about enjoying those films and appreciating what they do for archaeology? But on the other hand, making sure people know this isn't really what archaeologists do. We don't all wear hats and carry whips. Well, most of us, at least. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. That's uh, one of the main things. Like I love Indiana Jones. It's one of my favorite movies ever, uh, except for the fourth one. We won't talk about that yeah. one. Or the second one. <laughs> <Actually>. <laughs> yeah, no, one in three. <laughs> one in now, three. rumor is the there's another ones. one coming soon, and, so um, hold your breath. You know, it, it was a big factor when you're watching it. You see the adventure, and you still kind of get those feelings when you're on site, but it's a very different reality once you're in it. And, yeah, that's it is a very big inspiration. Harrison Ford is, of course – one of the you know beacons that we all look to for archaeology. He was even on the board of the AIA at oh, some point as well wow. because of his contribution to the field. So that I think was really interesting because yeah, without him we wouldn't have the the outreach that we do. I would say right the popular kind of media that we have with him. So I love that, but I also want to show people like yes, that is really cool and that's very exciting. And the real archaeology can be just as cool and exciting as the movies if you understand it properly but speaking of the real archaeology you yourself have just recently returned from excavating by the sea and bare feet from what i understand uh in oman so tell us about that experience oh yes that probably was one of the most relaxing digs i have ever been on it was absolutely amazing so the site is called ras al jins it's just at the corner of oman right at the arabian sea and the site is an early Bronze Age, Bronze Age site just on a turtle reserve, which is the most amazing thing. So sometimes in the morning we would have turtles hatching and we'd go and save them from the seagulls and try to save as many as we can, put them into the sea. And because the layers were digging in sand, the layers are very fragile. So we're digging barefoot, which is something I had never done before. I came prepared with my big clunky work boots and everything like that. And we were just troweling in the sand. There was no pickaxing. It was really nice for sieving. I learned so much about shells and uh, fishbone identification, which is something I never thought I would learn about. So it was definitely one of the most educational experiences that I've had with archaeology. I learned more in those two weeks than I think I ever did during any other degree or studying that I've ever done. Uh, you know, I'm thinking I'm thinking about that environment. And I did see the some of the pictures that you posted from there. Um, you know, having worked on many sites myself, you know, stratigraphy is something that's always fun for me. It's just like building that layer cake. I always like to see the individual layers. Uh, but how does it uh, like how do you do that in sand? Like, what does it look like? How many layers are we talking about? Because I'd imagine that's a completely different understanding of stratigraphy. Definitely is. I am used to the hard soil of, of Greece, essentially, right? Very, very just red brown soil. And for me, that was always a little bit more difficult to see the differences. But with sand, you can actually really get to see all of the layers. So we would have, you know, really big black sand in some bits. We'd have really loose, finer sand. We'd have splotchy sand in some bits. And when you see the strat stratigraphical profile, when you're drawing it, I find that that was actually some of the best learning I did with figuring out about stratigraphy and layers because with the sand and the sea, it really does, you know, wash it on in layers. And you can really see how that progressed over time and how the sand was, it, you know, able to change. Finding charcoals very easy in the sand, which was very nice, or burned patches. 
post holes are much easier because the sand is a completely different color. So I really enjoyed learning about the stratigraphy with sand because it was something that you could physically look at and understand it a little bit more than maybe clay layers, for example. Yeah, that sounds like a very unique experience on all fronts. You know, part of uh, the uniqueness of you, what you contribute to archaeology is the way that you do it, uh, utilizing social media to uh, reach people. Again, I should probably note, I mean, that there's a certain comparison that could be made between uh, how we try to work and how you do, because Jason and I actually gave a short lecture last year about using more social media to engage the public and educate about archaeology. So I'm interested in knowing also what the uh, reaction has been to some of your work, uh, both from the academic community and you know those who are actually professional archaeologists and also people who are maybe laymen in the field but are interested in it. Yes. Yeah, so generally, everything has been extremely positive with what I've been doing. I've had a lot of archaeologists that are um, a little bit more around my age that are really passionate about science communication. And they're also trying to do their own work. So we have, for example, Amelia, archaeologist. She does uh, videos in sign language to make it more accessible that way. We have uh, some American guys as well from the Life and Ruins podcast, very similar to what you guys are doing with all of that public outreach and amazing science communication. And yeah, good friends of ours. With them. Yeah, they're really nice guys. Eh? I love them. <laughs> and um, they... You know, all of that kind of community has always been very receptive to it. I've been getting emails over the last years, pretty much ever since I've started the YouTube channel, from students in middle school and high school asking me questions about certain subjects that they're learning in archaeology that they don't quite understand. And some of them are even asking me, hi, I watched your videos. I really loved it. It's really confirmed that I want to study either archaeology or, or art conservation. How do I move forward with my academic career. And I think that is what is really lacking from society right now, from this community, because people aren't knowing, people don't know where to go. They don't know how to continue in the field like this. And so having that resource online and that's widely accessible to everyone is super important. So everyone that's doing all this science communication, I just tip my hat to them because it's becoming such a maybe a lot more of a accepted thing. Lately, with a few academics I've uh, discussed with, they're not quite impressed with the democratization of archaeological knowledge. Their fear is that people that are presenting this information online are not, I would say, well versed in it enough, or they will have a lot of misinformation come out, or they would just do it for the, you know, the fame and the accolades and the exposure. But in my mind, even if people are trying and the real information gets out there, we need to be doing that. Because right now, so many pseudoscience ac accounts are living, you know, going wild on the Internet. They're having 10 times the amount of reach as real archaeologists. So the more that we push it, I find that then the kind of maybe older academics that are not so understanding of social media and public outreach would start to appreciate it a little bit more. Yeah. Actually, speaking to that point too, Raven, um, you know, I feel you, and it's a bit of a double-edged sword because I we've got a lot of friends too in, you know, the archaeological community who are responsible, well-trained, serious scientists, and they're concerned about just anybody getting involved in, you know, discussion about archaeology, even if their intention or their ideology, even you might say, uh, falls pretty squarely into, you know, academic corners. But I think that, like you're alluding to, uh, although it always must be done so in a responsible way, the, the lesser of the two evils, you might say, is to promote uh, serious archaeology rather than, you know, crazy ideas about things. Uh, you know, rampant speculation, there's plenty of that. In fact, maybe too much. And I think it's important to, I mean, really look at the simple solution there, engage with academics, engage with professional archaeologists. That's one great approach. If, if citizen scientists and if avocationalists can be doing anything, they can be going to professional archaeologists and allowing them to have a voice, giving them a platform. Uh, also what you do with your uh, videos. So, you know, again, to me, I think that it is in the best interest of the academic purpose 
to try and you know hold them up and to show the world what they do and to do it in a meaningful way and in a way that the public can understand and that can resonate with them. Oh, definitely. And, you know, you always see that there are some academics that get very upset about what's being said online about certain things and how all this misinformation is being spread around the world, essentially, with people having all these different ideas as to what actually happened in history, things like that. And I really want to say, like, look, this is your opportunity. We now live in a world, in a society where you have a voice. You can actually be out there and give the correct information and people will listen to you. They're hungry for that real knowledge. So it's not about, you know, grumbling about what's happening. The presentation that Mike and I made at the 45th Annual Conference on South Carolina Archaeology was essentially what we're talking about. We were discussing with many academics and many people in the audience that if you want to combat all the pseudoscientific uh, information, YouTube videos, all of these theories that are out there, you too have to put out information that combats. You have to put out good information that's productive. Uh, but I know what you mean when you those sensational videos, they're going to have a million hits and one that is actually archaeologically sound and, and based in data and facts will have 300 hits. And we, we understand what we're up against, but the f- fact of the matter is we do need this younger influx of science communicators, of archaeologists, of scientists of all disciplines to be putting out good information because if no one's doing so, then all you have left is essentially things oftentimes that people are just making up off the top of their head. Your channel in particular is important because uh, you're reaching a different demographic. Um, So, you know, a younger group, someone who understands how to create this content and get it out there on on the the webs for everyone to see and but it you know often we talk about the seriousness of this but there's also some humor there's some good times to be had with it as well and that's what i want to talk a little bit more about your channel it's because i've noticed you have videos that are kind of split into instructional or informative videos you have travel videos you have some that are humorous so when you were putting together your catalog of material um, was this intentional or was that just a natural development of the channel a little bit of a natural development. I really wanted to start off with the academic videos. And then when I realized that I could have some fun with it, I kind of really started to go a little bit further into it. So the, the education is always the base of every video that I do. But in able to being able to kind of have a little bit more fun with it to engage a different type of audience is always a really fun opportunity. So maybe the, for example, the the archaeological pickup lines one that we did uh, last summer with uh, my friends from Greece. And that one, you know, it went viral mostly in the archaeological community. But then people start to ask you questions like, well, what does that mean? And then that kind of gives you a really good jumping off point of, well, this is really funny because... And then they understand archaeology from a whole different perspective. Uh, recently, we're doing the Archaeology Reacts to videos, which are very fun to watch. But again, it's very that, uh, you know, making that accessible to the public, taking a movie that everyone loves that maybe people have wondered about, but never really gone further into studying it and saying, like, here is everything you need to know about it. But we're going to have fun doing it. So I really like these new kind of ways that I'm kind of going around with my videos to kind of engage not just myself, keep it exciting for myself, but excite other people that maybe aren't quite searching for, you know, how to do stratigraphy, essentially. Yeah. And uh, let me say this about the reaction videos, okay? <laughs> they're, they're definitely a lot of fun to watch. You have one on Raiders of the Lost Ark, one on Tomb Raider, one on The Mummy. And uh, so explain that a little bit for the listeners if they're not sure exactly what they mean by reaction video what exactly are you doing in those videos so what it is is uh my friend jude and i we will sit down and we will watch a a movie with archaeological information or historical information or based off of some sort of uh, archaeology or history and then we will react to it from an archaeological or historical perspective so we usually make food with it that's very themed we try to have our own fun with it while we're filming it and we really go into some of the topics that get misconstrued or are not represented properly within the movie so we'll say like yeah this is really fun but here's what it really is and it's uh, been a, a quite a it's made for some quite fun 
weekends with Jude and I and just have fun and just filming these videos and eating good food. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what one of the main reasons we do what we do. We we love hanging out with our friends and doing this these projects together. Now I have to I have to bring this back to you. Can't let you go without answering this question. So you mentioned your viral video, so I have to ask, what is your best archaeological pickup line? Ooh. You gotta give us one. one. I <laughs> I'm gonna say the one that actually didn't make it into the video because the sound didn't come up properly, but it was is that a trowel in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Very really good. bad Very one, good. but it's you know, it's that fun corny that you have to laugh at. Oh of yeah. Course. Well it is fun. You gotta have yeah. fun doing these things. Yeah, you know, and again, obviously you have a lot of fun doing what you do, you do it well. Raven, I want to thank you for being on the show with us. And um, if you would, please, of course, we'll have links there in the show notes at sevenages.org uh, to all of your work. But uh, if you'd like to tell listeners a little bit about what you do, where they can find you online, things that you've got coming up, and also other things they should be on the lookout for, we'd like to give you an opportunity to do that now. Amazing. Thanks. So you can find me everywhere under the name Dig It With Raven. I've kind of got the name for all the social medias on my website, my YouTube channel, my Instagram. I am mostly active on Instagram and YouTube. I've just posted a reaction video, part one, for us reacting to 10,000 BC. So that's going to be very fun if you guys want to watch that. Part two is coming soon. Then for the future, I will be posting a lot of things on site. So what archaeology actually looks like. I have a lot of footage from when I was digging in Greece. I have footage from Oman. So I will be really posting a lot of compilation videos on what to expect on, in archaeology, what the real archaeology is. And then I will be working on as well uh, a series on ancient gaming. So I'm really excited for that one. That sounds really fascinating. And of course, all of your work is Raven, I want to thank you for being our guest. Perhaps somewhere out there on down the road, our paths will tra uh, cross as we continue our mutual search for answers about our past. And thank you again for being our guest here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Well, thank you so much for having me. I definitely hope that we can uh, cross paths at some point and meet in person. But I uh, think it was a pleasure chatting with you, gentlemen. Excellent. Thank you so much. True pleasure talking with Raven. I tell you, I look at her, her new content, her website, and I always look forward to her YouTube videos. Uh, she's doing a great job. I think what she's doing is really reaching a, a new demographic and a new audience. And so, you know, do her a favor, give her that follow, subscribe to what she's doing, and uh, keep up with her. She puts out a lot of great content for the uh, archaeological aficionados out there. Oh, she certainly does. And again, it's always important to find that balance between educational, but also entertaining in this social media age. And she is certainly both of those things. We'll have all of her information linked right there in the show notes at sevenages.org. And of course, that will be disseminated to all of the podcatching clients you guys use to listen to this show every week. And with that, it about wraps things up. Gentlemen, I know right here in my space-time quadrant, they have stay-at-home orders going into effect at 8 p.m. So we've got just enough time for one more round, and then it's off to engage in safe practices. I hope everyone out there listening, of course, will do their part. And don't forget, again, we do want to hear from you in these interesting times. And we will do our part by keeping the podcasts coming. So you guys stay safe and stay healthy out there. And, of course, stay in touch. On behalf of all of us here in the Crosstime Pub, I am Micah Hanks. He is James Waldo, and he is Jason Pentrail. And together we are the Seven Ages Research Associates, and we will catch you again next time right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal.